Hello, my name is Andrew Weens, and I serve as Vice President of Government Relations for the Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce. Thanks for joining us for this video today. We're going to be discussing the many changes that have been made to the unemployment insurance or UI program in Kansas, not only by the Kansas legislature, Governor Kelly, but also Congress. Uh, these changes were made primarily because of the impact that the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, has had on labor markets and the economy. However, uh, the changes made by the legislature particularly were also made in part due to the 737 MAX supply chain layoffs that occurred earlier, earlier this year across our region and state. So we hope this information is helpful to you, whether you're a business owner, manager, employee, or just a policy nerd. Uh, let me start by introducing our guest on this video. So we're thrilled to be joined by a Wichita, who is serving in Governor Kelly's cabinet as Kansas Department of Labor Secretary, Delia Garcia. Uh, Secretary Garcia was confirmed by the Kansas legislature in May, 2019. Prior to that, she served in executive leadership positions at several national organizations, uh, organizations in Washington, DC, and she made history in 2004 by becoming the first Latina and the youngest female to serve in the Kansas legislature. She, she's a graduate of Wichita State University and also granddaughter of the founders, Rafael and Connie, of Wichita's oldest family-run Mexican restaurant, Connie's Mexico Cafe. So she has plenty of local Wichita flavor, you might say. Uh, also joining us today from the Kansas Department of Labor is Laurel Klein Searles. Uh, Laurel is KDAL's unemployment insurance director, originally from Minneapolis, Kansas. Laurel graduated from Kansas State University and then earned her JD at the Washburn University School of Law. She's worked as a staff attorney with the Kansas Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence, an appeals referee at KDAL, and later as chief of appeals. And then she worked a stint at the Social Security Administration as an attorney advisor prior to starting her current position as UI director. Uh, we're also happy to be joined by Philip Hayes, VP of HR Services and Operations for the Arnold Group a human resource company and Wichita Chamber member. Uh, Philip manages and oversees company operations, including the design, development, and implementation of all client HR programs. He holds a master's degree from Friends University and is recognized as a certified senior professional in human resources through the HR Certification Institute. He served on the Kansas Society for Human Resource Management, or SHRM State Council, the Wichita SHRM Board, and the Board for the Workforce Alliance of South Central Kansas. He currently serves as chairman of the Kansas Employment Security Board of Review, and he was a key advocate in legislative reforms to the Kansas UI system over the past several years, and he remains active in that legislative arena. And finally, we're joined by the founder and president of Watkins Public Strategies, Jason Watkins. Uh, Jason also serves as the Wichita Chamber's legislative consultant. He's owned multiple businesses during his career as a former member of the Kansas House of Representatives and now serves as a contract lobbyist who spends many of his days in Topeka uh, during normal times at the Kansas State House advocating for the best interests of his clients, including the Wichita Chamber. Uh, Jason will tell you about this a little bit later, but he actually served in the Kansas House during some of the same years that Secretary Garcia served, so they've been in the policy trenches together before. So let's go ahead and dive into the policy trenches right now. Uh, Secretary Garcia, let me first start by giving you the floor to say hello and provide some opening remark remarks to our Wichita Chamber business members and perhaps maybe even some of your friends and family and business contacts in Wichita who will watch this video. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for everyone uh, watching, especially all my Wichita friends. Um, yes, it's, it's been a bit of a whirlwind these past three weeks, um, but I, I, I must say that we here at the Kansas Department of Labor have do, been doing everything we can to work with you, and I want to thank each and every one of you personally because uh, we're going to get through this, but through a partnership, us working together. Um, I know we're going to talk later on in a few minutes about some of the programs to take advantage that we offer, but one of the key ones that you all have been helpful and utilizing is the file by spreadsheet. Uh, that is one of probably the most key tools to helping uh, employers and also helping us process uh, claims over here. But in a few minutes, I'll, I'll share with you sort of what we've been doing with um, staffing and uh, programming and what we plan to do in the next coming weeks with all of this coming in. We're in unprecedented times. Um, as you all know, heard the numbers. Uh, so we have Tuesday, we release our Tuesday, uh, our statewide numbers every Tuesday afternoon and they're available on our website under uh, unemployment insurance weekly review. Uh, and then the US Department of Labor releases theirs every Thursday. So last Thursday um, they had reported 6.6 .6 million on top of the previous 3.3 million, which roughly is about 10 million in the country, which includes our Kansas in the last two weeks, we had about, about 79,000 in just the last two weeks. So we are definitely in unprecedented, unprecedented times, but we again are doing everything we can uh, to serve our Kansas employers and, and workers 
Um, and we, we're going to get through this together. It's a little bumpy right now. But thank you for all your support. Great. Thank you for that. Could you quickly just tell us how things are going at Connie's, uh, considering how hard restaurants and the hospitality industry have been hit by the COVID-19 crisis? I know a lot of our members are in that industry and uh, just would kind of love to hear an update from you. Yes, um, and thank you, Andrew, for asking. Um, and my heart goes out to the hospitality family, just because I, I know very well um, how that feels. Um, we did have to shut down about a week, and a week and a half ago, it seems so long. Um, and they are, are bearing through, um, just as other ones are, and really taking advantage of some of the programs being offered at the federal and state level. Um, as you know, the Department of Commerce had offered the um, higher program, but that money went, it, it was gone within, I think the same first 24 hours. Um, and so I, we had tried, but uh, we had missed it. And as, as in many other restaurants, so we are um, still looking at other options with the federal uh, grant money and also other opportunities that would become, will be coming and um, being provided for the restaurant hospitality. But we are getting through this uh, just like the others. So thank you for asking. Yeah, thank you for that update. Um, with such a dramatic increase in new unemployment claims, you mentioned this a little bit uh, previously, uh, I think we had a 1,200% increase, weekly increase in initial claims a couple of weeks back. Um, just how are you and your staff doing during these challenging times? You mentioned, you know, staffing up, but how are you guys doing? How are you handling all this? You know, we're handling it as best as we can, and I always like to share um, how we're funded. So we're federally funded, at, and with this program, with our unemployment insurance program, so it is also connected in to our the unemployment rate. So as you know, we were at the lowest uh, we've been in 40 years at 3.2% prior to all this, just a month ago. Um, and so that, uh, equally con consequently to that, we had a lower staff and lower funding. So when this happened, we switched, went from high to low overnight, literally. Um, so we were staffed accordingly. Uh, each of our staff, um, it requires about a six month training as a special skill set. And so um, that was challenging, but what, what was a good uh, situation we had was we have an, a lot of amazing staff who uh, we promoted internally. And so we still have them, but just in other parts of the agency. So we asked them to please come back and do a refresher. So we did that in the first week, we trained them up and gave them a refresher training. So then we doubled our staff uh, from about 20 to 40. Um, that was in week two. Now we're going into week three, uh, whereas the governor has, um, uh, supported us in getting other agency staff to uh, help us with uh, the phone calls. Uh, that's another number I forgot to share with you earlier. We're about Monday, last Monday, we had had 877,000 attempted calls and we only have 200 lines. And as I shared with you, the number of staff. Um, so it's just astronomical numbers, but having this, uh, the governor's working with this, with uh, providing the Amazon call center and getting more staff there. So we are getting another 15, I believe, uh, agency staff from other parts of the agency to help us and we're training them today and tomorrow and we'll have them up and running by Wednesday. So we're aggressively doing this. We're looking and considering all options on how we do that. Uh, we also, I think it's important to share that we are operating on an old mainframe. Um, I was born in 1977, so was our mainframe. And so that's, that's the, how old our mainframe is working. So we're doing as best as we can. Uh, when I came into my position last year, I, I recognized the moder we needed modernization. So we started then building a plan through the summer and the fall. We were starting to phase it through and we were just hitting about phase two and then the coronavirus happened. Uh, it's still, uh, obviously we wanna do that, but we are, you know, we are not able to go there right now, but it also uh, exasperates like the need, the very important need. Um, so again, we're doing the best we can with um, reassigning and, and upskilling some of our staff and, and refreshing and using other staff. And we're, we're going to get through this as long as we get to these, some of these uh, IT kinks um, and then getting people to use our website at www.getkansasbenefits.gov. That is the key website to use uh, for our employers and workers. Great. Well, thank you for that. That's a lot of calls. And uh, I've heard stories and rumors about the Department of Labor IT system that you guys have to deal with. So appreciate you powering through yeah. that. Um, and we're not the only demand. state. Yeah. yeah. All the states in the country are struggling with this. So, but yeah, I wanted to share that specifically for Kansas. Thank you. Uh, and Laurel, feel free, obviously, to jump in with answers whenever it's appropriate, um, now that we're getting into kind of the nitty gritty of the UI program. 
Um, could one of you tell us about how long you anticipate the number of new weekly claims to continue at the accelerated pace that we've seen over the past few weeks? Or is it just you know, a big unknown depending on what happens with uh, shutdowns in the economy at this point? Okay. Well, right now it is a big unknown. Everything is happening so quickly. So usually when our labor market team looks at data, they're looking at, at data that's a couple months old before they're able to forecast. Now we're seeing things change literally overnight, as Secretary Garcia said. So it's difficult to do any forecasting type models of uh, where this is going to spike out. We're kind of all along for the ride right now and anxiously awaiting numbers from last week to see what that spike was. You know, you indicated, you reported the 1,200% spike in uh, initial claims from two weeks ago. I never thought that I would see that. Then we saw it grow even larger the next week um, up up again to the 55,000 initial claims. And then I'm just anxious to see what it's going to look like when our numbers come out tomorrow. Got it. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so you mentioned this earlier, Secretary, um, about mass layoff spreadsheets. Yes. Could you tell our members, uh, a lot of businesses that are part of the Wichita Chamber and uh, across the state, what the, they can do, what Kansas employers can specifically do to assist KDAL with this spike in demand? So for our Kansas employers, we have two tools available for their use, and they can find this on our website at www.getkansasbenefits.gov. Um, if an employer is being forced to um, make uh, some temporary layoff uh, for where were workers, they can file by spreadsheet. And filing by spreadsheet means the employer will be able to submit the initial application uh, for their unemployment insurance benefits for all their employees. And they'll have the opportunity to provide information at once. Uh, instead of responding back and forth with us here at the Kansas Department of Labor. Uh, again, I want to thank, personally thank the employers who have been doing that. That has been helping us push along through. Also, I want to say when you do that, you have direct access to one of our staff on the phone directly, and you don't have to be in line with one of those 877,000 calls. So that is a huge plus there. Also, um, another uh, tool is our shared work program. And our shared work program it's, um, it's an adverse program that if you want to avoid layoffs, it um, allows for reducing work hours for employees while providing a partial unemployment um, insurance benefit at the same time. Uh, and you can also find that on our website as well. Uh, but those are the two tools that we are um, offering for employers to use and working very closely with them when they do choose to do that. Okay, great. So just to clarify, um, would you all prefer that any and all employers use the mass layoff spreadsheet? if they have to make layoffs um, along with the associated guidance for their employees. And then if they do choose to use the mass layoff spreadsheet, that's to be uploaded over the internet through that website. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So um, it, we have been calling it the mass layoff spreadsheet for years, but it's really a misnomer because you can, an employer can file on behalf of one employee. You've had spreadsheets for one employee all the way up to our biggest one was last week that was over 9,000 employees. So we do have the capability to process any number of claims through that spreadsheet. Don't worry if you just have, you know, a handful of employees, you can still utilize this process. And it's going to be a useful process for the employer, for the claimant, and for the Department of Labor, regardless of the number of employees on the spreadsheet. And you do upload that. So most employers are familiar with our employer por portal at, at KDAL, in which they submit their quarterly wage reports and, and such, you uh, can submit that spreadsheet through that portal. And there's a very easy and simple process to provide that information to the agency. And we've seen um, really happy employers from it, which is always a success. And I wanted to add one other reminder along in this whole process uh, that employers do um, should uh, tell, they have to inform their employees that they are eligible for unemployment um, in, in all of this to make sure they're informing their employees. Okay, thank you. So last question on the spreadsheet. What mm -hmm. happens if an employer uses the mass layoff spreadsheet and then an employee also files an individual claim as well? Oh, yeah, it, it delays the process, but you can go more. In yeah, it, cre it creates an issue. So if the as secretary just spoke of, it's important that the employer uh, do communicate with their employees and let them know, all right, I am filing this mass layoff spreadsheet on your behalf. You do not need to submit an initial claim because if that claimant goes in and submits an initial claim uh, on top of the spreadsheet filing, which also acts as initial claim, then it errors out of our system and we have to go back and do work on the back end to fix it, which ultimately delays payments to the claimant. 
Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass the torch now over to Jason Watkins and ask him to ask the next couple of questions related to the state and federal changes to the UI system. So take it away, Jason. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, appreciate being included into the discussion. Um, and, and as you mentioned, uh, the secretary and I did serve together. In fact, uh, we came into the legislature together and, and uh, co-authored some um, legislation early in our careers. So yeah. special relationship with the secretary. It's always good to see you. Class of 2004. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, Madam Secretary, Congress um, has also been uh, busy making changes at the federal level to the UI program. Uh, the president signed the CARES Act after Congress passed that into law. I think that was about 10 days ago. Yes. Um, the CARES Act temporarily enhances and expands UI benefits through a few key programs. Um, could you give us a, a kind of a high level overview of what those changes are uh, and has Kansas Department of Labor uh, entered into an agreement with federal government to be able to offer those provisions? And I'll let Laura talk about the uh, changes, but I will speak to um, how we, yes, we did uh, enter into the agreement. When uh, the bill was passed on a Friday evening, 10 days ago, Saturday, we were over here scrambling Saturday, Friday night, Saturday morning, uh, those hours. Uh, hurry up, signed it, went and got the signature of the governor and then sent it out as soon as possible. So then by the deadline, which was Sunday the 28th, um, so we, was, we were eligible to be a part of it in the beginning. Um, and then I'll have yeah. I'll talk about some of this. So a couple of the, the programs that I think are, are garnering the most attention are the uh, additional $600 on top of someone's regular unemployment insurance uh, payment. So you know in Kansas, the weekly benefit amount that a person can, can receive is between $122 and $488 per week. The Congress has added an additional $600 to be paid on top of that. Uh, for all eligible UI claimants. So that is a, a key piece that's put in place for Kansas workers. Additionally, um, the other program that's garnering a lot of attention is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. That's the program that you hear about in relation to self-employed gig workers who are not traditionally eligible for unemployment insurance benefits because they do not have what we call covered wages. And so <laughs> this program creates a completely brand new program that has never been available before to be able to pay them with a benefit. So the first thing that you have to know to be eligible for this program, you have to be ineligible for traditional unemployment insurance. And so uh, both of those key pieces of the legislation, the guidance came out from USDOL just over this weekend. So it actually came in yesterday on Sunday. And so we have already started going through that on the additional $600 piece. I know my business team has already sent our requirements to our IT team. I can't tell you how long that's going to take to, to get into place and have those $600 in benefits paid out to claimants. Uh, because as Secretary Garcia mentioned earlier, we're working on a mainframe system from 1977 to try to get this money out the door. Uh, but we're doing everything that we can to get it out as efficiently and as soon as possible. On the PUA program, as I mentioned, that is a completely brand new program. So um, we'll keep everyone posted through social media. The website will also do a, a lot of media around this when that program is up and running. But we're just now at the beginning of stages where we're just getting our initial guidance. Um, another important aspect of the CARES Act that a lot of people have not been talking about is the relief, the tax relief for uh, nonprofit and governmental employers, they do offer a 50% tax credit for the governmental and nonprofit employers. That was also in the CARES Act, um, which is an important provision that we're working to implement as well. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. And just, just want to clarify, because I think there has been some confusion maybe in the public and the media in terms of the $600. So as the secretary mentioned a little bit ago, the, the top level for state uh, benefit is 488 a week. The yes. 600 is on top of that, correct? Correct. It is an additional $600 on top of whatever your weekly benefit amount may be. Okay. Very, yeah. Very helpful. Uh, if an employee is not terminated, and, and Secretary, I think you kind of mentioned this a little bit as well, but mm -hmm. if an employee is not terminated, but his or her hours are reduced, will the employee receive the federally funded $600 UI benefit in addition to that kind of cost share that you described a little bit ago? 
Yes. So the answer with most things in the unemployment insurance world is it depends. So if your hours have been reduced enough to qualify for a, a partial payment for your week, so you can work part time and still receive an unemployment insurance benefit as uh, and we will reduce it. But then they will add even on that reduced weekly benefit amount. If you're working partially, they will still add on the $600 per week benefit. And it has to be uh, impacting related to COVID-19. Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And you mentioned that the employers can use the spreadsheet, but if somebody uh, has lost a job or had their work hours reduced and their employer isn't doing that through the spreadsheet, uh, could you just tell folks how people would file for unemployment, including for the $600 federal supplement? Yes. So an individual would go to www.getkansasbenefits.gov. There are two areas. Uh, we've rearranged our website. So that's another thing we've done uh, since all this started. And so there's a section for individual and then there's also for employer. Uh, so they would click on the individual and follow the prompts. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the UI benefits that people will be receiving, are those, are those taxed and will the department be offering guidance or should employers offer that guidance to claimants regarding potential tax bill on their UI payments? So unemployment insurance benefits are taxable. Um, we will send out a 1099G in January of next year. Um, and it's really, we do have an option uh, on our webpage to withhold taxes from your unemployment insurance benefits. And really that's the individual claimant's decision whether they want taxes withheld or not. Okay. Uh, one concern that's been discussed since the federally funded $600 supplement is paid on top of the, the, the state level UI benefit. Um, will some individuals actually receive more uh, than they would have otherwise earned actively working? I seriously doubt it. Um, that's my opinion. <laughs> anything, anything is possible. I mean, it, it is possible that, that someone would receive more through the, this program, especially with the additional $600 per week that Congress has, has added on here. Um, we haven't gone through and, and figured out what that cutoff will be. So how much you will have to be earning. Definitely low wage earners, those making minimum wage, very much may be that your weekly benefit amount with that $600 tax on top is going to be more that you would be making on minimum wage. Um, but we have not done the wage calculations to see where that, where that breaks down. <clears throat> and when I was referring to that, it's like, I'm, if I'm a waitress, I've been a waitress before, and uh, usually that's at the lower end. So mm -hmm. like, so if someone's on the lower end of the $122, I mean, that would still yeah. be. But I think also it's important to note that it's also like a, a means tested uh, benefit. Like, so you don't get healthcare with that, which is important at this time, right? Um, or any other uh, assistance. Yeah, I understand. Um, so we're hearing from some of our members who are concerned about that potential, um, that it could be larger than that average weekly wage. Uh, and, and the incentive then maybe for some that have been laid off to return to work or find another job could be diminished for a short period of time. What, what recourse do employers have when candidates refuse work or previous employees designed to come back or uh, decline to come back when that job is offered to them? That is a very good question, Jason. So there are some provisions in the law to help alleviate some of those concerns for employers. First of all, if a claimant refuses an offer, uh, offer of suitable work without good cause, they will be disqualified for unemployment insurance benefits. And that includes the additional $600 per week. So if you are an employer and you have offered your employee the opportunity to come back to work and they refuse, then the Kansas Department of Labor will have to launch an investigation into whether or not the offer was for suitable work whether or not you had good cause to refuse that suitable work. So traditionally, we would look at things like what the, the wages were, what the hours of work are, how far away is it from your home. In light of COVID-19, now we have to factor in other considerations like are employers taking appropriate safety measures, ensuring social distancing, those sorts of things. Uh, but it should be that, you know, if you have an employee that is 
ready, willing, and able to work and refusing just because they don't feel comfortable, but you have all safety measures in place that they ultimately should be disqualified for unemployment insurance benefits for refusing work. Additionally, I know the concern comes up about somebody doing the math. You always, I've, I've heard this and it's always driven me crazy. Someone saying that I could make unemployment more on unemployment than I could actually working. So there's also a provision that USDOL has put out in their guidance that if someone quits solely to take advantage of the unemployment insurance system, that we are to consider that to be fraud. This is not a time for people to be preying on the unemployment insurance system. We need those benefits for the, the people that truly need them. And at that point, um, and what she was just saying, if there is a fraud investigation, that's where we would want to partner with you employers to do the investigation um, as, as it pertains to the suitable work. Absolutely. So um, we'd ask employers to cooperate with us in any audits or investigations that we do in this and certainly report your any any known job refusals to us so that we can investigate those as well. Typically, those are self reported by the employees, which is not the most effective method. So if you're an employer and you people that you know are receiving unemployment insurance benefits and are refusing work, you can also uh, make a, a tip to the Kansas Department of Labor and we will then investigate. Okay, well, thank you. A couple more questions uh, of particular interest to our um, employers regarding the UI taxes. Will the CARES Act related UI benefits be chargeable to the base period employer? It depends uh, on the tax relief that's offered um, because it currently it's, it's not in the uh, in there right now. Yeah, the current CARES Act only provides tax relief to uh, governmental and nonprofit employers and not to our contributing employers. Um, so certainly if, if Congress wanted to pass additional measurements, we would be supportive of them offering some, some tax relief to our contributing employers as well. Okay. Um, so the rated employers, will they have a shared burden for expanded benefits as well as benefits for self-employed and gig workers that receive the UI benefits? Also a good question. Um, the answer to that is no. So those benefits for the self-employed and the gig workers through the PUA program is completely federally funded. So none, none of our Kansas employers should be taking a hit for that. And just so you know, that's a separate part of money. The PUA, it's known as PUA, it stands for Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. Um, that was sort of replicated after the, the DUA, DUA, which is for, um, like the last one we had was Green, Greensburg. Greensburg Tornado, it's for the Disaster Unemployment Assistance. And so it's somewhat similar, but um, also very brand distinct. New. <laughs> yeah, very brand new. So we'll, we don't have a lot of information on that. We just received guidance on the other piece just la late last night. So we'll be looking at that and then the PUA in the following uh, weeks come. Okay, well, thank you. Considering the application volume that you all, you all are experiencing and the understandable difficulty that employers have in obtaining notices, information, et cetera, it, you know, it seems inevitable that, that some people are not going to be able to respond in a timely manner. Uh, mm -hmm. As you mentioned earlier, the department's doing its best to process claims uh, as quickly as possible. But it's a challenge right now. This probably goes back to the blanket, non-charge question through the entire base period, which you just answered. But could you comment on how forgiving the department will be uh, as far as timeliness goes? That is, that's still a question that we're struggling with, and I will tell you why. I completely understand and sympathize with the employer community in this. You all are as overwhelmed as we are here, and we know that we are in this together, and we have to work through this together. Um, however, the U.S. Department of Labor guidance has told me that I need to stick with my deadlines if an employer has not met the, the time frame to reply, uh, typically it's a 10-day time frame that they have to, to reply, that then I am to move forward with charging them. It's not, I mean, personally, not something I'm in favor, favor of trying to work with our, our friends at USDOL to find some leeway there and offer more allowances for business. But I don't have anything to report at this time. If and when we are able to, to make those changes, we will definitely let you know. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks Jason for asking those questions and uh, the Department you, of Labor team for answering those, appreciate it. Um, 
it was really helpful. So thank you. Um, and then I'm going to hand over things to Phil right now, I think to really get into the weeds even further with some questions that he's received from some of his clients. So Phil, take it away. Thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to join everybody today for the conversation. Um, as this pandemic has had tremendous impact on businesses across Kansas and the nation, employers are having to respond in, in a number of different ways, making very difficult decisions uh, impacting their employees. With that, I appreciate the opportunity for the dialogue as business owners and HR departments seek answers and additional guidance and clarification regarding support and the various programs that KDUL offers, as well as um, in helping them manage their responses uh, involving their employees. So first question, given the governor's recent statewide stay at home order, do we need to require employees to provide any documentation if they're not at work due to that order? Thank you, Phil, for that question. Right now, we are not uh, requiring that. Correct. No, we are not currently requiring any sort of documentation uh, from claimants related to the stay-at-home order. Thank you. Um, employers are advised not to request medical notes, but it appears the DOL uh, new unemployment claim form is asking for this when claimants are applying for unemployment. Can you provide some more clear understanding as far as what qualifies somebody for unemployment right now or documents that may be required? is an interesting question, Phil, because we are not systematically requiring medical notes from anyone at this time. So the only time that we would be requiring medical notes is if you indicated that you are not physically able to work, then there would be a form that would be mailed out to you, uh, or you'd be asked to download it from the internet that you and your healthcare provider would be able, uh, as a claimant, would be required to provide to the Department of Labor as we're doing on uh, ability eligibility determination. However, at, at this time in light of COVID-19, we've recite, received guidance that if someone's unable to work due to COVID-19, that we need to be more flexible with that. So we're not you know, holding people as accountable to that measure as we have in the past, but uh, certainly it is something in order to be eligible for benefits, you have to be physically able to work. So that's the only time that we seek that medical documentation is for that particular eligibility issue. It's not required of, of every single claimant that applies and certainly not something that we would ask uh, employers for. Got it. And I, I really think that's uh, some feedback that employees are bringing to their HR uh, departments mm -hmm. and looking for clarification. So just for my colleagues, really it's no change from the norm I think there just may be some additional concern with the COVID-19 uh, currently going on. So I appreciate that, that guidance. Um, additionally, some employers want to use the employer file by spreadsheet as KDOL is encouraged, but they don't want to file a claim for somebody if the employee or employees don't meet the criteria. And I think really um, that kind of addresses that if, if uh, there's some concern about what related to COVID-19 is. And, um, can you give us a little bit more clarity on that or, or some guidance how the HR departments can give to their employees? An example was shared with me that uh, let's say an employee's child has a fever and the employer has a policy that you and your household need to be fever free for 72 hours before returning to work. Therefore, the employee misses a week of work. Would the employee be eligible for unemployment because the reduction in hours was due to the COVID-19 protocol put in place by the employer to keep their staff safe and their doors open? Okay, so I'm hearing two questions here. One is about first, um, how we determine whether or not to file an initial application for a claimant uh, by spreadsheet. No, 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 it, it, the, the, the question really, I apologize for interrupting because um, uh -huh. I think we've addressed that already. It's if the HR department has concerns if they're gonna use the spreadsheets, but they're okay. trying to determine if it's COVID-19 related or not. So I think when you're filing that, that spreadsheet, you have to use uh, your best judgment to term, determine whether it is COVID related or not. That's something that we're um, tracking, certainly for statistical purposes, um, is the primary indicator on, that, uh, on the spreadsheet itself. You're still, you still have to file their weekly claims and answer the traditional eligibility requirements. And we will assess whether or not somebody is eligible based on their responses to their weekly claims. So my answer is you should go ahead and move forward with the filing and let our staff at KDOL determine whether or not someone is eligible or not. And uh, if so, if there needs to be a, a reduction in benefits or, or something along those lines. 
Excellent. That's definitely helpful. Uh, what about situations with part-time employees? If an employee has lost their part-time job but works for another full-time employer, will his or her UI benefit amount uh, take into account the payroll from the full-time employer as well? And if so, will it hit the full-time employer's UI account um, and their rating uh, in the subsequent years? So in this scenario, just to make sure that I understand this completely, the claimant works a full-time job and a part-time job, loses the part-time job, but is still working full-time, correct? Correct. If that person is still working full-time, they are not going to be eligible for unemployment insurance benefits. That's one of the um, primary criteria that we look at is if uh, how much they're working. If they're working a full-time job, they're not going to be eligible. Now, if it was the other around where they're working a full-time job and a part-time job and lose their full-time job, uh, but retain their part-time job, they may be eligible for a partial unemployment insurance benefit. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> some employers going into the furloughs or the shared work program a little bit more specifically now, some employers are struggling to decide whether to furlough or lay off employees. If an employer has some folks with no work for a week or two or they're into a, a lull, will those folks be able to collect unemployment benefits during that period? Yes, they should be able to uh, collect unemployment insurance benefits on a temporary basis if work has, has slowed down and work is not available at that time. Excellent. What I like to tell people is if at any point it's impacting with, through COVID-19 um, in the time frame within the last three weeks, mm -hmm. that's pretty much a good litmus test as well. And kind of what my, my guidepost has been, if, if we're not certain, we're still going to encourage employees to go ahead and file or we'll file on their behalf to the spreadsheet and then yeah. let the process really kind of take shape. Uh, and that's the best. I mean, when, when you think about putting um, those yourself in the, the shoes of the claimants um, or those potentially impacted, uh, we certainly want to give that alternative so absolutely um, i think that's the very best advice that you can give thank you um can you comment on the max duration that an employer may be able to furlough an employee and what the criteria is or if there's any grace periods associated with furloughs so um it the kansas legislature responded to the COVID 19 crisis along with the aerospace crisis in order by providing uh, 26 weeks of unemployment insurance benefits for claims filed on or after January 1st, 2020. And so really uh, around the furlough piece, I mean, they, the employees can receive the benefits for the full 26 weeks so long as they are, are eligible. Um, so. This, the 26 weeks would really kind of be in play. Uh, yes. Along that line, um, I apologize for the kind of the, the new question here, but um, employees that have exhausted their claims or their, their benefits, that they were qualified for 16 weeks prior, they filed before January 1. Um, I think I had re heard on one of your uh, FAQ uh, webcasts that you just encourage those, those employees that have exhausted those to go ahead and file a weekly claim and whether PUA comes into play or if there's going to be some additional assistance down the road, is that the best recommendation that HR departments can offer? So if they have exhausted their weekly claim and they've exhausted all 16 weeks and you know that their claim was filed prior to January 1st, 2020, I don't believe there would be any need to, to file any more weekly claims. Uh, but those people may be able to receive assistance from uh, PUA, PUA, when that uh, program goes live. And so to advise them to uh, you know, watch out for information related to that, we'll certainly be publicizing it as well. And then they can apply for the PUA program at that time. As I said earlier, the first requirement for PUA is that you're not eligible for traditional unemployment insurance benefits. Uh, and so if you're already at the point where you've exhausted benefits and got that information from the, the Department of Labor, we have that. We do tell those who are self-employed um, and who so would not traditionally receive unemployment insurance benefits to go ahead and file for unemployment insurance benefits now so we can make a determination about whether or not you're monetarily entitled because we know that you um, cannot be eligible for benefits to receive for traditional UI benefits to receive PUA. So that's where we are encouraging filing at this point. 
Gotcha. Thanks for that clarification. Last thing, um, or not last one, next question. If a business wants to furlough an employee who has X number of um, accrued or unused paid time off, can the employer force that employee to use that time prior to filing an employment claim? Yeah, sorry, the question again is to... Can they can they use can they can the employer tell them to use their their accrued time off? So that is a question that really falls outside of the the purview, purview of the unemployment insurance program. Certainly, you have to look at at other factors. It probably comes down to your employment agreement with your employee uh, at the Department of Labor. Um, there's certainly not a requirement from us that they exhaust their leave before seeking unemployment insurance benefits. But you may have an internal. Uh, policy procedure contract or something that requires them to exhaust leave first. Okay, that's helpful. Um, many businesses like the idea of the shared work program. If an employer does the shared work program for say four weeks of the allotted 26 weeks in a 52 program year, um, and ultimately the business demands forces them to move forward with a layoff after that four weeks, do they owe any penalties or back pay of unemployment payments to their employees? No, not at all. Excellent. Um, with the 20 to 40% reduction um, in hours as part of the shared work program, can an employer cut a five day work week to a three or a four day work week per employee or do they have to simply lessen the number of hours work per day per employee and maintain a five day work week? No, I think most employers do shorten the work week to three or four days versus shortening the hours each day. I think economically it makes more sense for employers to do that. And, and certainly we don't have a requirement on how you reduce the hours. <laughs> if you choose to reduce it um, over the course of a, a five day work week, or if you reduce it down to three or four days, either, either method works. Okay. Due to the low volume or in response to lower business demands, can an employer rotate their staff by working one week on and one week off through the shared work program? Um, you had to be 10% of the unit. Yeah, so you would have to meet the other requirements of the shared work program that there certainly is that that flexibility to allow for some sort of, of rotation as long as you are meeting the just basic requirements of the program with the reduction in the number of work hours and the number of employees impacted. Okay, and then how is the additional $600 weekly benefits in the CARES Act applied to those on shared work? Will the full 600 be applied to those other eligible uh, claimants or is it reduced to 300 or a different amount or perhaps nothing at all? What I'm being told right now is that the full $600 uh, per week applies to claimants on shared work. Okay, thank you. That's uh, certainly been a, a hot question that's come up. Um, next, if an employee is in an affected work group or unit for a company that's participating in the shared work program, how is compensation for paid sick leave or the uh, modified or the paid FMLA under the fam uh, Families First Coronas Response Act categorized? So um, it would be the it would be categorized as other paid leave, so other paid uh, vacate sick leave which would count as wages for the purposes of unemployment insurance benefits. Okay, and getting close to the end of my questions here, if a company participates in the shared work program, are they still eligible for SBA funding programs such as the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program through the SBA or the Payroll Protection uh, Program? You know, that's a very good question. And I have not looked into, I've been so busy with unemployment insurance that I haven't had a chance to look into the SBA funding programs to know how participation in the different UI programs would impact them. I'm not aware of uh, anything that would prevent them from utilizing those those programs, but I'm certainly not an expert. And so, uh, and one other important uh, point to add is USDL, you know, just issued all this guidance. And we also are talking to all the other departments of labor's um, across the country. Um, and so they're sharing, you know, various information. And one of the things was around that, but I couldn't re remember that piece. My guess would be, and, and it's not a fact, is a lot of flexibility is, is being allowed with some of this program uh, application. So I'm sure we would see that, but I, I can't speak. Thank you. Thanks, Phil, for asking those questions and the Department of Labor for answering them again. Um, and I don't, I don't, from a chamber perspective, that if you're eligible for the economic injury disaster or 
protection program that you wouldn't be eligible for shared work. But, um, you know, if we hear more information on that, we'll certainly keep our members apprised and I'm sure uh, Philip will do the same for us. So um, I'll go ahead and close it out a little bit. We just want to say thank you again to HR expert extraordinaire, Philip Hayes, for the questions. Um, let's go ahead and get some educational info out to our members about some of the benefit amounts and the trust fund. Uh, if you guys have the information in front of you, of course, uh, Secretary of Labor, could you, uh, or Department of Labor, could you tell us what the minimum, maximum weekly benefit amounts are at this time for the program? So, um, the, the minimum is $122 per week and the maximum is $488 per week mm -hmm. uh, for the state benefits. And then, of course, as we talked about extensively, the additional $600 added by Congress. But that's okay. separate and apart from your weekly benefit amount. Do you have the average weekly benefit amount in front of you at the moment? Yes, it's uh, $391.73 as of the week ending in March 28th. Okay, great. And then just kind of for our employer's own knowledge, could you tell us how standard weekly benefit amounts for UI and for the shared work benefits are calculated? The UI benefits uh, in the shared work. So uh, both the pieces, we look at your uh, your base period. So we look at the first four of the last five completed quarters to look at your earnings. Uh, and then we uh, do a calculation based on your prior earnings to determine then what your weekly benefit amount is. That's for traditional UI and for shared work as well. Um, in order to, uh, and as Secretary stated, the minimum is $122. So if, if that amount were to fall under 122, we would bump you up to 122. If that amount was over 488, then you would move down to 488 as that is the maximum. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and then last question from me, although the Kansas UI Trust Fund was considered 100% solvent, uh, even just a couple weeks ago, um, if the fund is completely drained in a short order, will claimants still receive benefits if and when that occurs? Yes, they will. So hopefully we will not be in that position where we drain the trust fund. We came into this, as you said, in a good position. We were very, our trust fund was quite solvent. Uh, we were in the billion, almost a billion. Yeah, we we're almost at a billion dollars within the trust fund. Additionally, uh, we are one of the, I think we were in the top 15 yes. solvent states in the nation. So we are ahead of a lot of states when it comes to our trust fund solvency. That's thanks in large part to uh, legislation that was passed uh, in conjunction with those of you in the, the business community and uh, the Kansas legislature. So that has put Kansas in a good position to be able to see this crisis through. Uh, the U.S. Department of Labor, while they aren't offering um, some sort of tax relief that we would like to see for contributing employers right now, what they have done is to assure us that we can borrow interest-free loans if we do zero out the trust fund. Uh, the trust fund did go down uh, to zero and went into negative during the Great Recession. We were able to borrow funds at that time and repay those loans and end up with almost over a billion dollars earlier this year. So um, I feel strongly that even if the, the trust fund was depleted, that we would still be able to pay claimants benefits. And like Laurel said, we're in better shape than most days. We're number 14 in, in the country. And just to give you an update, um, the latest amount that this uh, trust fund has is $981 million, uh, And that was as of March 28th. So again, I want to say thank you to the business uh, leaders and the legislature for making that possible. Again, we're going to get through this with that kind of uh, leadership. And then also, like Laurel said, the federal government is going to see this. And so once other states are going to, we're going to be in a better position. Great. Yeah, thanks for that information and for giving us the most recent balance. That's helpful. Um, I know some of our businesses are even thinking about, you know, if they can make it through to the other side of this crisis and reopen their doors, you know, what, what are UI tax rates going to look like at that point and how are we going to replenish the fund? So that's something we'll keep our eye on and I know you guys will too. And uh, yeah, props to you all. Look forward for, to collaborating with you all on that too. Yeah, yeah, likewise. And props to you all for having a solvent trust fund and hopefully, like you said, we'll one way or another, we're going to make it through this thing. So let me just flip it back to Jason Watkins for a few quick closing comments before we wrap up. And then I'll ask Phil and then our guests from the Department of Labor for the same. So Jason, go ahead. Thank you, Andrew. I, I want to thank the secretary and 
uh, her team for everything that they're doing. Um, the, these are unprecedented times. And so the, the partnership between state government and business community, uh, and especially including the Department of Labor, I think is critical. We think about unemployment, I think oftentimes as, um, you know, it, it helps people who have lost work, but from the, from the business community standpoint, as was mentioned by the secretary and by you, Andrew, um, our economy had really strong fundamentals. I mean, it was moving along at a rapid pace. And as soon as we get through this short term um, problem with the virus, the economy is going to come back. And so from the business community standpoint, I know that we appreciate having a strong unemployment system uh, because it does take care of those workers that we care about. It also keeps them in our state so that when we fire uh, this economic engine back up, that talent that we've invested so much in uh, will be here and be ready to partner uh, with us and go back to work. So uh, thank you to the chamber for their work in this area, as well as the Department of Labor. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell my good friend, Secretary Garcia, that it's wonderful to see her again. Thank you. You too, Jason. Thanks, Jason, for those uh, comments. And we'll go ahead and turn it over to Philip. What are your thoughts, particularly for business and HR professionals who are going through these challenges? Certainly. Um, we understand this has been a very disruptive time for many workers whose employers have temporarily closed or seen a drop in their business. As information um, as this session has been, as informative as this session has been from the employer community, it's worth noting that KDOL is pushing out daily updates and FAQ video sessions geared toward climate concerns on Facebook. And I would encourage employers and HR departments to inform your impacted employees about these streams as well as the other information that can be found on their website, www.getkansasbenefits.gov. Uh, Secretary Garcia and Laurel, uh, we certainly thank you for scheduling time to answer questions from the employer community. Uh, we, we do recognize that we're in this together and wish to thank you for your current as well as your continued efforts for, for the entire KDUL team. You're all greatly appreciated. Lastly, it's my hope that uh, we move closer to our old norm in a few months, seeing record numbers of Kansans and Americans being recalled back to work, leading a very significant and meaningful Labor Day celebration in September. Uh, Kansas has pulled through some tough times before. We'll do it again together. And I just want to throw out that if I can be of assistance to anybody watching, feel free to contact me and I'll do my best to assist where I can. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Really appreciate that. Uh, Secretary Garcia and Laurel, uh, can you provide some final thoughts on behalf of the Kansas Department of Labor for our members, uh, business community in South Central Kansas and across the state? And anyone else that may be watching this, and I know Philip just plugged it again, but please be sure to again remind us of the web pages or resources that you'd like to point our viewers toward uh, as they look for more information on UI. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to Phil for promoting our website, www.getkansasbenefits.gov. We know it's very difficult to get through the phone lines right now. That again is one of the advantages of filing by spreadsheet is you get direct contact with not only a UI specialist, but one of our very best UI specialists um, working our, our employer responses. So encourage you to continue engaging with that program and the shared work program, because if nothing else, it gives you direct access to get your questions answered quickly and easily. Also, we do the daily updates on Facebook in the mornings at 930 every day except for every weekday except for Wednesday when we do a live town hall at 3 p.m. on Facebook in which we take uh, questions from uh, people just typing their questions in on Facebook. We're trying to get this information out to people as best we can to keep everyone informed. It's constantly changing. We very much appreciate the business community's participation. Secretary always says that we're going to get through this together and we are going to get through this together. It requires collaboration. A, a crisis of this enormity is going to require workers, businesses, and the state all working together to get through this. So thank you all for the opportunity to speak with your members today. And thank you for all that you're doing across the state. Thank Thanks, you, Laura. Laura. I just wanted to reiterate, um, of course, our website again at www.getkansasbenefits.gov and of course our daily um, information updates. But uh, also more importantly, a thank you to all of you uh, business leaders. I, I've, I've seen you all and been a part of this in Wichita. Um, you know, this is, this is personal as well, as you know, 
uh, it has hit my family and as it is in making that it was every Kansas family um, and it's trying for all our family businesses and every business. So uh, whenever I wake up in every waking moment, actually in my sleep too, I'm always thinking what can we do with our, for our business uh, leaders and also our workers. Um, my focus is that and that only and my team we're working uh, hard hours, extra hours. Um, we've expanded hours as well. Um, so that's what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna get through this thing and, then, and, and it's gonna be through a partnership. So I wanna thank you through the partnership. We're gonna get through this and after this, uh, get through this murkiness and we're also gonna get our um, families back and, and our workers back into place. Awesome, thank you so much, Laurel and Secretary Garcia. That was great. Uh, let me just quickly remind our viewers also of the page on the Wichita Chambers website where you can go for more info on UI and the other COVID-19 kind of response programs. Uh, and that's wichitachamber.org slash COVID-19. Uh, it's called the Wichita Resource Center and it includes a number of resources for employers as well as employees. So again, we appreciate everybody taking the time to join us today and particularly to Secretary Garcia and Laurel for joining us with all the other demands on your time. You could probably be, you know, sitting there answering 800,000 phone calls. So <laughs> I know you're training staff to do that and we appreciate that. Uh, but we just want to say thank you for your service to our state. Um, and I know you guys have been putting a lot of hours in, so we appreciate it. Uh, even with the antiquated UI system, you guys are um, doing the best you can and, and keep up the good work. Um, and I'll also say thanks to Jason and Philip for, for your expertise and for joining this discussion. And I uh, hope everybody stays healthy. You too. Thank you. All right, should be in the clear.